Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Bruce Aitchison and I am your host from Happiness is X-Shaped on the Happiness is podcast where we have some special guests, people that I think are special, mostly people I know and have met, whether that's in real life or virtually, but people that I think have got a story to tell and oh, do we have a story to tell today. This is a man that I've never met uh, personally, but I've watched for many years. I watched live in the stand as he was down there doing his thing in international rugby. Uh, I have admired for a long time and someone who lives life with a smile on his face and definitely has stories to tell. He has met some very interesting people. He has done some very interesting things. And I am keen to spend a little bit of time talking to him, but especially listening to him. So without any further ado, please welcome Mr. Rupert Moon. <laughs> that was a hell of an intro, that was. Well, oh, you oh, are dude. a hell of a boy. You yeah. are a hell of yeah. a boy. Do you know, I've been around a bit and I, I'm, <laughs> I'm 53. I'm 53, so uh, I'm on the other. I'm slipping that way, not that way. So I'm uh, going to make the most of this. So uh... you're you're not slipping any which way. <laughs> you still, you're the kind of person that still has a young spirit, though. You still find the fun in things. Do you know? I I do have to pinch myself um, and go. Am I really 53? <laughs> you know, I feel like I'm like in those early 20s. You know that's where it is, but I suppose that's well, that's with age. You get um, a little bit less affected by what people think, what people you know, what people say when you do stuff. You have to be aware of not embarrassing um, your family <laughs> um, too much. But uh, with the they've, they've got the name Moon, so they've added from there on in, and then um, they know I'm a hat wearer. So yeah, I just have to be careful in that way. <laughs> but you. are you're so full of enthusiasm for things. And do you think, who was it said that the youth is wasted on the young or something along those yeah, lines? Yeah, it is, isn't it? If you knew now what you knew then, yeah. crikey, you would, uh, <laughs> you'd sail the seven seas, wouldn't you? But, I, you know, I didn't do too bad when I reflect back on it because I had, um, let's put them like this, I, I had disciples of change. So these were older, wiser men and women that would uh, guide me through my uh, early career on and off the field of play. And they, you know, they were mature people who'd made life mistakes, yeah. um, but also they'd done things so well that they wanted to do it twice. And so they wanted me to replay it too. And so, uh, so I got the chance of going, oh, that was good. You've got to try that. <laughs> okay, I'll try that. I'll try it. I'll try it. But also some of the things, the mistakes you made, you sometimes you've got to have the old, Bloody nose, um, not literally, even though I have had a few of those um, from a large Ulsterman uh, <laughs> once in the European Cup. That's another story. And um, and five others, actually, that have broken my nose, and there's a distinguished list. But, yeah, I, I, I'm very lucky because you are the person uh, that you, you brought up, your family, your influences from there, but also your, your friends and the people you hang around with. And I was giving that piece of advice as a young man when I was playing for Abitaleri, which is a... Yeah. team at the top of the Gwent Valley. Um, I'd played a game, and after the game, this reporter had come up to me, and he was a lovely, lovely man, Tom Lyons. And I just said, you know, talked about, you know, you played well, and he was a, an experienced uh, reporter from the Daily Express and uh, had had, com had written on famous boxing matches around Randolph Turpin. He was like in his late 60s, early 70s then. And he just said, talk about giving people time and making the most of time. And um, it, it stuck with me and resonated with me because listening when people are talking is really important. Um, but also when you're talking to people, um, giving them time because that's their snapshot of you and that may be their only time they meet you. Um, but also just benefiting from the experience of both, whichever way it is, um, to take a little bit from it to shape you or not shape you. That, I love that. that. That's their snapshot of you because so many people have made their judgment on just that, haven't they? A snapshot. And Isn't rugby life players, like that? Isn't uh, life the, like that? The, the, the number of people that have judged the rugby player on his attitude and persona on the field and judged them as this, that or the other. And then when they meet them, they're surprised. or And it's given people that chance. And you've 
you grew up at a time, especially in this game that was so different. You were, they, when was the last time a Daily Express journalist was at a club game in Wales? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, he did live in Ely in Cardiff, and uh, yeah, he, but he, yeah, he'd um, he travelled the world. But yeah, it uh, it is something very unique. Back in those days, in the late eighties, early nineties, it was a it was like basketball and netball to uh, to what rugby was or is now. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, I was very fortunate. Uh, P- the team members, you know, you know, were the, the transition of young players with uh, being surrounded by experienced players, and we we used to socialise and spend two or three nights a week together. So you're training Tuesday, Thursday. You would spend time after the game to, after training together, and then Saturday night you would spend every <laughs> Saturday night together. So I was spending more time with these people than uh, my girlfriend or my uh, my wife. Uh, even, uh, but I didn't get married till after I was playing uh, playing rugby anyway. But it 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 is you you know you know these people and their lives inside out when you're you know four thirty game over shower upstairs food walk of shame or walk of pain after the game. <laughs> and Leslie used to have this thing you see at Stradley Park. The food, you you go from the dressing rooms at Straddy and you'd have to go upstairs and there's like a, a patron's lounge for so the guys that were and ladies and gents who would invest in the club and support you. And you had to manoeuvre and negotiate yeah. your way through to get to the food on the far side. <laughs> so it was character building because there were <laughs> people that chucked a couple of quid in and there was people who were very, um, well, not backward in coming forward in their yeah. opinions of your performance. And so you had to negotiate that to get to food and sometimes it would take you 20 minutes sometimes it would take you an hour and a bit <laughs> but you were uh, it's character building stuff and i i learned a lot from that that's uh, being able to front up and justify your actions or explain your actions is that it, i mean uh, would you like to be a player now would you like to have the way you're judged now well, you you live in an unreal real bubble, and um, when I was I was commercial director of the the Scarlets, and I was asked by the chairman to come back and make the new stadium feel like home. We were losing quite a lot of money, and we'd moved from Stradi to this fabulous new place, yeah. and it was the dream. And it shouldn't they shouldn't have it. It shouldn't be there, but they do. And as they've always done in the hundred and twenty odd years they've existed, is punched above their weight in Clefley. and this stadium is. A citadel you know and wales have played there recently and it is fantastic yeah. but it didn't feel like home um the players could get in their car after the game and just drive away they used to have players food downstairs um, and they would never see anybody win lose or draw but we worked with nigel davis who was the the then coach um and said and he was one of my teammates with the uh, the scarlets with Clatley, and we both agreed that it is important that they engage with the people, the people, the the fans, the supporters, the investors, to make sure they know know they're real human beings, and so it was a it was a they had to walk the walk of shame and the walk of fame through the Quinell Lounge, the famous Quinell Lounge, <laughs> surrounded by images of Derek and Scott <laughs> and Craig and Gav. You know the you know that's a that's a that's a challenge in itself, but having to. <laughs> Having to walk through there, and it was a long room to get to your food, but there was a bit of kickback from it, but they, they did it in the end. Um, but it's not something the modern players used to because they, from academy level um, straight into pro, you, you rarely meet people outside of your bubble, which is a shame because it, it, you need to learn other skills than having hanging around with people who are just like you. And and you've you've played at a time where Welsh rugby was probably still quite romantic. It was the clubs that was playing in places like Stradley, go, going to yeah. local derbies, playing against guys that you would then join up with to play with for Wales. That that must have now reflecting on it, maybe at the time, maybe didn't appreciate it. Now do you reflect back and think, bloody hell, I was lucky? Yeah. Look, us oldies always say that was the best time. Um, I, I was the I was lucky that I crossed both divides. So pre ninety five, post ninety five. So I had, you know, six six years post professionalism, and uh, there was it was still there was still a flavour of it, 
um, because of the people that were in charge of the club uh, and coaching the team then. Um, but yeah, looking and, and seeing what they do now and how tough it is. And yes, it's a living and you earn good money. But the, the, what makes rugby is the, is the camaraderie, the bonding, the, the, the stuff after the game. Nothing before. It's, it's about drinking uh, champagne in Leeson Street with Michael Bradley in the kitchen. <laughs> you know, after my fir- after my first cap, you know, packed. You can't get in anywhere. And you walk down those streets in Dublin, and you, unless you're with someone of that ilk, you can't get in anywhere. And it was like going into the front room, and we went through the front room and into the kitchen, and I was sitting on the dishwasher <laughs> drinking champagne with Michael Bradley, crikey! And uh, my girlfriend at the time got so drunk that I had to carry her home, and I nearly left her on the on the sidewalk on the on the pavement because I was just so exhausted from training from the game. I was a broken man and it was a real toss up between do I, you know, do I leave her there or do I, I do, 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 do. And, I, and of course I asked for, I asked for guidance from many Welsh and Irish people that were around at that time of, in the early hours of that night and uh, asking for assistance. And there was, a, it was a, it was touch and go uh, what was happening. And I, I'm sure she would have done the same. Obviously we're not together now. Um, <laughs> so we know what decision I made, <laughs> but yeah, those, um, those experiences are, I cherish, and uh, you know, no fo- no mobile phones, of course, and the way that the the society has changed. But rugby needs still, and, I, and that's why the Lions are so Im- important. Uh, li- that is something that allows um, us to step back in time. I think, and I never had that that experience, and I think that players now do miss out on. Um, becoming even better people. I know the rule, the laws of the game help us with respect and all that, but there's something more than that that we we should cherish. And I'm a big believer in that young academy players should go and play real rugby, which is like playing for Borough Muir or, uh, or St Mary's College in Ireland or uh, literally, you know, going to play for uh, Abba um, or You know, real rugby, because people are having real experiences on a daily basis and then putting on a pair, a pair of boots in their shorts and playing on a Saturday afternoon for the fun of it, for the love of it. Not Do you think that's, grits. is that why the Barbarians have had a bit of a renaissance recently because pro players are desperate for a bit of that? Yeah, and, and if, I think that's their only, because most players, it's a bit like, you know, when Scotland beat England uh, recently in the Six Nations, None of the Scotland team um, were alive or were born when they last beat England. So you know this was you know they, they, that snapshot of celebration of what it's really like to be in a in a clubhouse after they've played an early kickoff and watched the game, you know, and had that social experience to watch the the national team play would have would have been amazing. And I think yeah, the Barbarians is key as well as the Lions for that happy go lucky carefree environment but i think saturday afternoon rugby club rugby is as well you know yeah it's i i love club land and one of your must be life highlights not just career rugby highlights is when you put one over on the world champions yeah Um, when i it feels like a million years ago in 1993 (laughs) 1993 that is uh, you know i you know, it's great talking to, to people like you, Bruce, and, and Ben Elmwood. It's cathartic <laughs> to remember that moment. You know, as I as I talked to Gareth Jenkins, who beat the New Zealanders in '72, he said it was an awful game and the ball in play was less than ten minutes. You know, uh, and that's the reality of that. And they won, and yeah. uh, you know, they were nine three. You know, the ball bounced off the crossbar, and that was the end of that. You know, and the, for us, it was a similar experience. Just the the memories of of the preparation before the game, Ray Gravel giving team talks in the dressing room. And someone's uh, unearthed footage of him doing that. It's on YouTube oh, somewhere. Really? We oh, had an okay. analyst. We had an analyst. If you think how ahead of the game we were in 1993. So um, Tony Waters, who was a guy who would film our training sessions and our matches back in wow. 1993. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And he put, he, he, he's no longer in the, involved in the game, but he found lots of videotapes and as, and, and sent us some clips and it was lovely because he was in the dressing room on the Thursday before we beat Australia. And he was talking about, because obviously he was working for BBC, how they were trading. So he would go, he was, uh. he was, watch, he was watching in those days, one behind closed doors, <laughs> watching what they were doing, the moves that they were doing, and then reporting back to us and basically gave us a team talk on the Thursday night and inspired us. And we were ready to play that night. And uh, well, actually we used a move 
we used a move which was called Ella, which was based after Mark Ella, which yeah. was their move against them. <laughs> it's for the time. <laughs> and that, you know, we, we'd had a dabble really? at it once before, but that was because of we knew what we did. And Alan Lewis, our coach, and Gareth Jenkins, and basically it was their move, and we used it against them. <laughs> Mad, isn't it, when you think back of it? But to beat the world champions, yeah, look, the, the thousands that invaded the pitch. But we always used to have, at half-time, everybody encircled us when we were staying on the field for our oranges, and you'd have hundreds of kids circling just us playing, on the field. Yeah. yeah, just, well, they'd be wanting autographs, and they'd be want to be in the team talking. You'd have, like, a an eight-year-old who's, you know, next to you as you're going, come on, boys, we've got to get it again. We've got to raise it, you know. And, uh, there's an eight-year-old there. Imagine what you know, as you're as you, as looking up in the team talk. And you know, you know, you're, you're obviously not watching your your p's and q's then, but just to be that child on the field at Stradley he would have been yeah. like listening to that, and I'm sure some went on to play for the club after that. But you were you were also the only show in town. There wasn't there wasn't satellite TV. There wasn't yeah. Monday night games and all this and nonsense. It was a Saturday afternoon or that midweek. I mean. Playing under the lights was one of those. Oh, he felt he felt so special being Didn't under you, the lights. You felt strong and quick, and I loved it. You know, I literally loved night matches. There was a yeah. place in Tradiga, so you go and play for Abbotton area in Tradiga, and Tradiga is right right at the top of the valley, and you'd always arrive in the darkness and leave in the darkness. And I always <laughs> used to think, you know, I always used to think that Tradiga, where the pitch and the posts were, when the ball went off the end of the pitch, it never came back. <laughs> I, I, I thought it was the end of the world. I thought there was like a, I thought there was like a, a drop, like a, like a severe drop. It's like a, oh my god! If you fall, if you get pushed out with the dead ball line, you're going to fall down the mountain and never come back. So uh, you know, you're always dabbing down in the corner and, and, and never running past under the post and giving it one of those just in case somebody nudges you off into the end of the world. Yeah. But the, those those kids, like their ambition would have been to play for. The club and then Wales and all those other things might have happened, but their immediate ambition would be I want to be like that guy because he's so close. And at half time uh, on Monday morning, he'll have been in the playground going, I was in the huddle on Saturday afternoon. You'll never guess what I heard Rupert Moon say. I mean, that would have just been like being in Hollywood. Look, and that's the key bit you've got to be within touch of touching distance. And uh, when I was in North Wales, I was asked by the Welsh Rebellion to help develop a team uh, for, for North Wales. There's a third of the population live up there. They wanted to grow rugby in there. We can't, you know, we've had amazing success, but we're still ignoring yeah. uh, a part of the country. And so they set up, we asked to set up a regional team. And one thing was key was our academy players going back into schools. And we had a, a personal development program. It was, a, it was basically, it was you were, um, you'd sign up for 14 hours a week community service with us. And so unless you're in full-time work or education, you were doing community work, which was um, going back into schools to help with literacy. So you'd be reading a book with a, a seven-year-old boy or girl and yep. literally talking about your experiences, uh, relaying what you'd been doing in training. So you were improving yourself because as a 17-year-old kid trying to teach a seven-year-old kid what it's like, and it's hard and not everybody can do it, but that communication, we had them working in libraries in Colwyn Bay, Llandidno and across uh, North Wales, helping the unemployed get them to do a CV, um, wow. to, to get an email address. Um, that, and that was a challenge in, in itself because they were coming in a tracksuit um, and turning up and sitting there and having to sit with a computer. And it, it wasn't it wasn't optional. This was, yeah. you know, they, they were they had to do it. So both people wanted to get it done as quickly as possible. But Again, as an 18-year-old, you're trying to communicate with a, someone who's a long-time unemployed or an ex-military or who's had some life challenges. He needs help, and you've got to help him, and you've got to communicate that message. We also work with North Wales Police, so with uh, young offenders who were, have, were brought up in challenging backgrounds, and they would train with us. So they'd go in the gym with our players, and again, it was, it was one of those things that maybe people were fearful. You know, are, you, are they going to give us you know, bad, bad things to our players who are in the academy. And, and I said, no, no, because it's, that's real life. This is, you're going to come across people. And, and these young people on both sides, whether in the rugby or uh, coming from the young offenders side, uh, had uh, learning experiences. And hopefully they became better people. And I'm, I'm proud lots of them have. James Lang, 
James Lang came through that process. So I, oh, really? I bagged him from London, stalked his, uh, him and his parents and said, because he's Welsh connected, you see, so he, he's Welsh qualified. He was unique because I think he was English, Welsh and Scottish, Scottish qualified. Yeah, yeah and uh, he came to play for us in, in RGC in North Wales. And I still have nice messages from him and his family about his journey from, from playing against Bargoid for North <laughs> Wales uh, and missing the kick in front of the post. To, to go to play for, but he, it was it was one of it. That was a really tough learning curve for him. Yeah. I remember the first game he played, he had a kick to win the game and missed it against Bargoid. But at the end of his time with us, he kicked the kick to win the league to 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 make us go up to allow us to go up. And he grew in not only physical stature but his personality by being away from home and with his teammates. And it's I'm really thrilled to see how he's progressed. And he, uh, he's a good one because he's got gas. He can kick, he's yeah. tenacious and he's brave and he fits in that Gregor model and his chance will come. Oh, chance will come. It's, it's so good to hear how passionate you still are about all these things that you've been involved with. And rugby, rugby was your thing. And, you know, I've spoken to you before. The two things, whenever Rupert Moon comes into my head, there's two things. There's, there's the collar. The and, then there's, and then there's the dive pass, and we we want to bring back the dive pass. How good would it be if in the Six Nations we saw Dupont or Youngs <sighs> or Ali Price throw out a dive pass? It would just be a joy. But those were those weren't exceptional things at the time. Maybe the collar. The collar was unique. To yeah. Me. Well, it was it was something that my brother had done, and you know, I, my brother was my hero, six years older than me, and he'd done because my dad had said, "Look, you know, players were grabbing him." And when he was making a break in the old days with the cotton shirts and the flappy collars, he just did get rid of it because people were doing it. And I was familiar with the sets of shirts because we used to sort five sets of shirts on a Friday night for the local <laughs> club. So I'd go in the garage with my dad and we'd be, uh, we'd, we'd be sorting the jerseys out, looking for the ones that weren't ripped for the first team. And as yeah. you came down to the fifths, there was collars dangling off here. There was rips here. There was rips under the arm. But that's that's the reality. So I was aware, acutely aware, of how the, the collar was being ripped off. And so my brother did it. And then obviously I wanted to emulate him. And I, under the floodlights of the clubhouse, when they used to open the curtains at night. So after the game, there was a, the dead ball line was right by the, the clubhouse. And so it, it, at the, when it went dusk, dark, it was like it was like unveiling at the theatre. <laughs> Someone would go in and say, ask their mum and dad and go, open the curtains. And so you, you'd literally, we'd be standing there, there'd be six of us. Um, and it was uh, Robbie Taylor, um, uh, Birchie, uh, Mark Taylor. I'm trying to think who else would have been there. Mal Walker, maybe, Chimpy. There was, we were there and it was like the <laughs> curtains would open and the lights would come on. And it was like, the, it's the lights of the clubhouse. And it was there, that was our theatre of dreams, the dead ball area. It was only like, the, the light would only go about eight yards <laughs> but it was a it was it was a big enough pitch for us at the uh, age exactly. of six and seven i loved it i loved yeah, it yeah so, and but the collar was that and then the dive pass came from a guy who played for england jan webster who played for our club uh, for warsaw and was uh, played scrum half for england against new zealand and they won and he got dropped bizarrely <laughs> the only person to get dropped i know really sad but he he was the the designer of the Dive pass, Jan he, Webster, no longer with us. He was Mister Dive Pass, and when I when I tweeted that, when I tweeted when you bring back the dive pass, Kieran Bracken jumped on it. Uh, Andy Nichol jumped in it. There was a few guys who who got involved and thought it was a nice a nice way. memory. It's the only way. You've got to get it in and out. Get it in <laughs> and out. Don't worry, Mike Phillips has done it. Peely, I'm not so sure. Peely wouldn't do it. He wasn't he wasn't a man who liked to get dirty that much. Quality in the <laughs> A lovely man, a lovely, he's a top man, but Mikey would have done it once or twice, I'm sure, in his career. We'll have to uh, search some archive. Wales have had quite a line of scrum halves. You're, you're in there need? with some <laughs> quality <laughs> scrum halves. Just what a, um, what a factory. And the same is now, you know, in those days, there was, you know, Rob Jones, Mike Phillips, Dwayne Peel, you know, Paul John, you know, Andy Booth, you know, there was a, there were loads of scrum arms and it, and it was about being in the right place, the right time, the good team that you were in, but there were some characters, the Bish before me, you know, there, there are, there are people who are just, I don't know whether it was just that character, those individual characters, and they were all different. All those names all had 
different quirks and skill sets, but we're in quality teams. And now, when you think of you know Gareth Davis and Rhys Webb, you know Rhys Webb not getting a look in, yeah. Thomas Williams, you know bringing back Lloyd Williams every now and again as an experienced architect of steadying the ship, and then Kieran Hardy is the one I like. You know he's a, yeah. he's a kid I've seen from a very young age, uh, local to where I live now, and he's he, you know he's got a lot of tools. He's got the you know a bit of everything. And uh, I'm excited to see him, maybe for this World Cup, but maybe the next one. Um, you know, he's got, he's got, and there's a good personality to him. He's a happy fella. And, happy fella. Well, he's he's a lot like Rupert Moon. What's the, the thing? I, I I never played international rugby. I played club rugby. I played lots, of, and I I loved the the before and the after. The bit where, well, now there is cameras and videos, but the <laughs> yeah. change the changing room was was your sanctuary and it could be brutal it could be caring it could be it was it was everything and you you went Whoa. through stuff in a changing room that's that's hard to describe but you were in you were in amateur club changing rooms you were in professional club changing rooms you were in international club changing rooms what what's the thing what is it for you about changing rooms i'm still traumatized by what i've seen in there <laughs> i mean i played Adult rugby at 17, so I'm going into an adult changing room of all shapes of sizes. You know, from when I was with Abertillery and the boys were coming from, you know, steelworks or the pit, you know, or just, you know, tough labouring jobs and they were covered in all sorts before the game. Yeah. St uh, stinking, things dragging on the floor, <laughs> you know, all, all, all sorts of uh, unpleasantry. And I, I, I remember at Neath going into the dressing room there, you've got Paul Thorne and Alan Bateman. Um, uh, uh, um, Mark Jones, Roland Phillips, Lynn Jones, Paul Jackson, Andrew Kembury, Kevin Phillips, Brian Williams, John Davis, Jeremy Pugh, and I'm going into a dressing room. Where do you sit? I remember just in, in a, a leaf, it's a really narrow dressing room. And I remember this that Mark Jones experience, and he's six foot five, and there's just been an article about him. Now he's in Dubai as a teacher, but he was a menacing guy with a, who used to wear a pink jock strap, and I'm still. <laughs> I still, just, I, just, I still remember keeping my head down and then looking up in this, this big clump of, of like inkness. You know, it's like it was like my it was like my nose was. It felt like it was there. It was like a, it was just on the. And, it, and then when he bent down to go in and get the, um, the the tablets he wanted me to take, which was desiccated liver and vitamin C. Obviously, it was like parting of the black the, the dark sea, the black sea, or whatever. The, it was like. All the lights went down. Like it was like, uh, 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 it, was, it was like, oh. And, and then when he, you know, he's handing them to me, it's like, blah, blah, blah. but he took care of me. I, you know, I'll forever be in his debt. And um, he had a bad stutter in those days, and he's admitted recently that that's why he was so aggressive as a player because he was angry for having the we had the stutter. Um, but he sang like an angel. I mean, he, he loved his buddy Holly stuff and his 60s oh, and yes. 70s. And I was in the back of a taxi in Dubai when we played. We guested for Leicester in those days. We could. And in 1988, it was compacted sand we used to play on in Dubai. So we used to spray the pitch with oil and then they'd roll it. And it's the same. It's great. They've just put grass on it now. But no. So Mark Jones would catch the ball from the kickoff and he'd bat a few people out. And then he'd go, morning, and then give me the ball. And I'd, I'd be like running down the beach. And uh, I dare not score because he, he wasn't going to chase me. But in the back of this taxi after the game, when we go back to the hotel, because you could only drink in hotels, I had Mark Jones in one. And then the door opened to another. And this was 88. John Eels got in. And I didn't know him at the time. And I was a young, you know, he's just an Aussie bloke. When I get in the back, share a taxi. And there, he, there we are. And I'm like this. I've got Mark Jones here, him here. In with a you know anger issues, uh, Johnny Hill's giving a oh, happy Australian, and then uh, Jonesy starts crooning a tune, crooning a tune, and he's joining in, and I'm like, I'm like two like two lumpers, I'm squished in the middle of the back of a taxi, but it was one of those life experiences, not so traumatic that one. <laughs> life, life experience, but those those stories away from a camera phone, away from just it's in your head, it's your memory, it's yours. And what what was your what was your role in the changing room? Who was what, what did Rupert Moon bring? Were you the the joker, the comedian? Did you put your arm around people? How did it go? I, I was always about, and I was 
I, I was in my second season at Clethley, I was captain, and that was a that was bizarre. When I looked around the dressing room, and there was Yian Evans and Nigel Davis and Phil Day, uh, Phil May, and um, Lawrence Delaney, you know, uh, Simon Davis, you know, these are guys that are you know were world class individuals with miles on the clock, and they're they're giving Rupert the skipper's arm. <laughs> At first, obviously, I'm, I'm trying to do a team talk, and I'm like, uh, uh, all right. I'd had one experience before because I captained the Barbarians against Cork Constitution, and Donald Lenehan was the, the captain then. And in the dressing room for the Barbars centenary season, there was Val Bartman and Eric Rush and all these blokes. And I'm, I'm Rupert, who plays for Abitillary. I don't know. I'm, giving them a, I'm going, where? Where? Where's his pride? Come on! We were inspired. Don't forget what this means to the people of the town, to what it matters most. It's not about us. It's about them. Do it for them. When you need it most, look around. Help each other for them. Well, that's the type of thing. And I kind of had it, did it for a few years. And the, the influence of Grav and other players and other coaches, as I said, shaped me. And my coach was... And my captain, one of my ca ca captains was Lee Jones, who went on to coach Japan with Eddie Jones, bizarrely. Yeah. And he was my hooker at Abitaleri. And another real big influence were two guys, uh, Alfie the Fruit Bach Bickle, Brickle, who was uh, my backs coach at Abitaleri, and Richie Tillians, the forwards coach at Abitaleri. And that was, they were the ones that really sort of brought home the reality of people coming to watch you on a Saturday and they're paying their quid or whatever it was back in the 80s. It was still hard-earned cash, and yeah. you're there to entertain and represent them because you represent them across the UK. Because Abertillery would still go and play in, you know, in England and Scotland, and we had those fabulous trips away, and you were representing the town. Yeah. So don't ever fail us and don't embarrass us on or off the field. Could could we get them to go and speak to some of these professional teams that just kick the ball up in the air and scrum for ten minutes and? It's a different yeah. kind of entertainment. I know it's a different yeah, kind yeah. of entertainment. And also, the, the one thing that could fix it very quickly is start and stop the, the clock from the scrum and the line out. You know, until the ball's back in play, the clock doesn't start. You know, so if there's a, yeah. if there's a scrum, once the whistle's blown for the infringement, whatever it is, the clock stops. Once the ball goes in, starts. We've got a guy that, or a man or a woman who press that button. Same for a line out. Ball goes in, start. A stop and then start once it's thrown in. That would ball in play time would be magnificent then because you know look at you know, Wales Australia in the World Cup. You know where they, I think they killed about eight minutes at the end of that game. Quite yeah. rightly, you know. And I, I remember in Ireland in my I think it was my the second time I played when I came back. I think I I went down the blind side. I mean the first time I went down the blind side and lay on the ball and you know wrestled with it for like for hours. It felt like <laughs> to see if we could win the game. So. Um, yeah, now you, there are tricks that you can do, and I think that would eliminate it quite quickly. Do you enjoy watching the game now? Um, do I enjoy? Yeah, I, look, obviously there are elements, and I watched, I watched uh, the Wales Island game because I sensed this was a like a back to the wall stuff, and so uh, let's see what this lot have got. And I think that, that it, it was a good. I enjoyed it. Um, we it's hit and miss at every rugby game you yeah. know i think the reality of of you think it's going to be glamorous and superb every time it, it ain't and that we're deluded if we think it is so yeah i like i like to i like to watch the game and the gatland era the 10 years of the most successful period in the history of welsh rugby was probably we wales played less and won more yeah you know we used to kick a lot we used to tackle a lot we relied on mercurial talent scoring some incredible um tries um, or we kick our penalties. Was it attractive and entertaining? You're winning. I don't care. As long as you're winning, you don't care, do you? I don't. You know, the, it went when you're losing without heart and without passion, and then that's the bit. So, um, so yeah, I do. I do enjoy it, and I, I think some tweaks of the laws will happen over the next couple of years. And it's good that there are rugby people involved in that law making. And I, you know, Nigel Owens getting involved in that a little bit more will help the game shape so it's still a little bit entertaining as well yeah <clears throat> there's some interesting developments i think to come there isn't there now yeah. you you've uh, rugby probably well absolutely shaped you and there are bits of it that 
has given you opportunities outside the game. It, it doesn't take long to look at Rupert Moon and you see businessman, you see a TV host, radio presenter, and then my favourite, having been a panto dame for three years, <laughs> oh, Rupert, Ru Rupert Moon pantomime. Oh, Talk, like that, is, is that not just one of those, is that British joy of a pantomime? Oh my God. It is the best buzz ever i you know i did radio and tv way back which was and i was live i used to do it on a sunday afternoon i was doing live quiz shows with experienced presenters and i didn't really appreciate how difficult that was but i loved it then and if i knew it now if i went back there i'd be like oh my god i don't know how to do that <laughs> but panto i became president of a pantomime group uh blimey probably in the early 90s Ray Gravel had stepped down as president of the Panto Group in Clefley, the Friendship <laughs> Theatre Group. And there's uh, there's some footage because it was, I think it was their, I don't know, 25th anniversary recently. Yeah, just recently, I saw uh, it. And, and, and I just remember thinking I'd love to be on there. And there were the pack theatres and I got various different parts. And then when, uh, on a Monday morning, this is how bizarre it is, on a Monday morning in Port Talbot, where it's always <laughs> foggy, so that place is right on the end where they, they pump out the stuff day and night. They pump it out. Anyway, on Monday morning in Blanco's, which is a, a restaurant owned by a, a friend of mine, I was having a breakfast meeting with someone. As I walk out the door, there's a, a character called Owen Money who has been on Radio Wales and B Radio uh, BBC Wales TV for like 40 years. You know, he's, uh, he's just maybe longer, maybe 50. And he, he was pushing his granddaughter and he went, uh, Money! Ah! Oh. I'm so glad I've seen you. I need your help. I need you. You need to help me. And, and I said, what? what it's been panto and my eyes lit up. With, wide with delight. And before he even said anything, what I was going to be, and of course, I was going to be a baron. I said, yes, 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 yes. And then I travelled South Wales and, um, ah, the buzz. And it was an adult panto, and it wasn't because it was um, we swore or anything like that. It was just the innuendo and the stuff. Yeah. But ah, oh, I, I I can't wait. I'd give it all up tomorrow just to be in panto every day of the week. I loved it. It's it's just you go. It's a bit like uh, where I hope people go to live shows to be entertained. The people that go and heckle, I oh, always yeah. think like why why bother? Yeah. But you go to panto already prepared that this is going to be a lot of fun. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I mean, a lot of players, uh, my teammates and opponents, said I was a pantomime dame from, from, the, from the time I stepped on the field. My melodramatics, I was always a, a bit of a one that would be able to, uh, you know, do a little bit, add a little bit of theatre to help the referees like Derek Bevan uh, get the decision right, maybe. I wouldn't say try acting. I was performing <laughs> performing yeah i can see that who when, when you look back over that playing career you i mean you've already mentioned some huge names who's the one that i don't know had the, maybe the biggest effect the one that has lasted the longest the one that you pinched yourself who's who's the one player the, the the player that helped me and he's still you know i'd speak to him every day phil davis was a massive influence on me because at the critical part of my career. So he was captain of Lethley, um when um, he invited me, him and Gareth Jenkins invited me to join from Neath. Um, and he was, you know, a larger than life character, you know, played for Wales, you know, as he should have been a lion, should have been a lion. Um, and we're still friends today and helped me in North Wales, came and uh, used his uh, influence and his coaching ability up there. And, you know, we, we're still big mates. You know, there's, there's Yian Evans and Nigel Davis. But Phil was the one that, as a player, helped me because he was my number eight with his big backside. Um, a goal kick in number eight in second row. Can you believe that? Yeah, with his big left foot. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so so it, it, he, was the, he was the trigger. But Hamilton Jones was another guy who, when I was a youngster, he was the one that played for Lethley against South Africa in 1970 and had come to college in Warsaw. And so he was the guy doing the team talks in the dressing room when I was there, sitting with my touch flag, uh, listening to him talk to Arnie Evans from Flamby Hangler Arth, or, um, or Mike Lewis from Aslavera, uh, or Gary Rowe from Glice. You know, and they were all these Welsh boys were in that dressing room, and I was just sitting there listening to them talking about what it was, how it much it meant to pull on the 
scarlet jersey of Walsall as it was in those days. So Hamilton and Phil, I would say, as players were influential because he was my first fly half as well as a when I was 16 years old for the first team, Hamilton was. And then Gareth Jenkins as my coach helped me for ever more. And those those stories of being so young and playing at that level now are... Crazy. It's just... crazy to think. First team rugby, adult rugby at 16 and a half. Yeah. I've, I've... Stroud away on a Friday night and Good Friday. I just made contact again with a South African guy, Tinas Pinar. When I was about to go into my last year of school, I played my first time for gala and uh, played in pre-season tournaments, but we played in a tennis side tournament at a place called Preston Lodge just down the coast yeah. here in, in Scotland. And Northampton had been invited, so we got to the final. And in the final, Gala played against Northampton. So I'm just turned 17. Gregor Townsend, Tim Rodber, Nick Tim Beale. Rodber. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Tim, right. Tim, Tim, Tim Rodber treated me like an empty tracksuit at one yeah, point. Yeah, yeah. I just... Oh, man. You've got the squarest shoulders you'll ever meet. <laughs> Look, I just had the like head. He just the square head. Just he was. I played with him in for uh, English universities, and he was like, uh, he was like that. Top man, brothers. Top man, as English as they come. Lovely guy. Lovely guy. But those, those are. I, I feel very lucky to be able to tell a story like that. But there's uh, now a schoolboy playing against at the time international rugby, but like not a not a chance would that happen. Yeah. And, and probably young, I mean, there has been some 18 year olds but nothing of like that and uh, yeah. playing adult senior rugby yeah, he's, a, he's unheard of in this day just because the physicality yeah. more than anything really yeah. isn't it you're, um, you're changing your shape and there are you know Peely was very young when he played I mean he was, he was 18 or 17 18 but he was a he was a specimen he was a machine from birth yeah <laughs> quality individual yeah, yeah. Rupert, I, I, as you know, I could speak to you all day long for, and I, I just love it. And we've, we've not even touched on half, so I reckon we'll have to do a part two. But what, what I'm asking people to do at the end is to finish the sentence. So I'm going to ask you what happiness is, and then you're going to finish the sentence for me. So Rupert Moon, happiness is? Um, spending time with uh, good people. And you've spent some time with some good people and I've been allowed to spend some time with you, which I, I am massively grateful for. I know you're busy between family life and business life and all those other things. So Rupert Moon, thank you very, very much. It has been brilliant to see you and speak to you. And I look forward to meeting again sometime soon. Take care. Thank you, sir. What an absolute gen. I've now spoken to Rupert. I think that might be my fourth time. And every time he's left me happier than the time before. He's got stories to tell. He's built relationships and had experiences and created memories that, that are a joy to listen to. And when you see somebody with that passion for life, that is inspiration. And it's within touching distance. The thing he said about those little kids being able to see it and feel it and touch it and breathe it and be right there is so, so important to that motivation, that ignition of something that makes you want more. And I really hope we get to speak to him again in future. My name is Bruce Aitchison. I've been your host for Happiness Is podcast. You can catch it on Apple, on Spotify and on Acast. You can watch the footage on YouTube and on Facebook. And I really hope that you'll join us again very soon. My name is Bruce Aitchison and my happiness is egg-shaped.